Tosiaan oikein hyvää iltapäivän puolelle olemme jo kääntyneet tässä päivän ohjelmassa. Ja seuraavaksi saamme ohjelmaamme mukaan kansainvälisesti merkittävän johtajuustutkijan ja kouluttajan professori Julian Birkinshawn London Business Schoolista. Hänen jälkeensä täällä seminaarissa keynote puhujina ovat europarlamentaarikko Sirpa Pietikäinen ja ulkoasiainministeriön alivaltiosihteeri Kai Sauer. Ja hashtag on johtajuussymposium, jos Twitterissä käytte keskusteluja. Se on ollut siellä hyvin kiivasta ja sitä saatte jatkaa. Oikein hienoa. Ja tilaisuuden tosiaan edellä mainittujen kiinot puhujien haastattelijana tänään toimii äh, Tampereen yliopiston johtamis- ja talouden tiedekunnan dekaani Matti Sommerberg. Ja tervetuloa tämän Kiitos. vuoden johtajuussymposiumiin. Niin teidän tiedekuntanne on, on jo yhdeksän vuoden ajan vienyt eteenpäin tätä johtajuussymposiumia. Mikä on se salaisuus, että teidän tiedekuntanne on myös vuodesta toiseen opiskelijoiden haussa aivan siellä kärkipäässä? Mä luulisin, että... Meillä nyt joka tapauksessa on hyvinkin mielenkiintoiset koulutusalat ja toinen ulkoinen tekijä ehkä Tampereen on loistava opiskelijakaupunki. Mutta sitten totta kai me ollaan pitkään oltu ja hyvä opetuksen maine on kiirinyt ja toisaalta myöskin varmaan kiirinyt se, että meidän opiskelijat työllistyy erittäin hyvin. Ja ehkä kolmantena seikkana sanoisin, että juurikin tämä johtajuussymposiumi kuvaa tavallaan tämän meidän tiedekunnan niin kuin rakennetta ja ajattelumallia, että me ratkaistaan tämmöisiä talouden ja johtamisen ongelmia hyvinkin monipuolisesti, ei vaan jostain yhdestä nurkasta, vaan, vaan katsotaan ihan seminaarin mukaisesti. Niin ja toisaalta jos miettii tätä vuotta, niin tämähän on taklattu niin, että koronapandemian takia tätä ei voitu järjestää, kuten aiemmin on todettu, tai aiemmin on järjestetty, mutta nyt se tehdään etänä. Kyllä, hyvä, kyllä. hyvä esimerkki siitä, että ketterästi toimitaan silloin, kun tilanne niin vaatii. Näin on. No, itse tutkit aikanaan väitöskirjatyössäsi sitä, miten digitaaliset teknologiat ja niiden mahdollistamat strategiat strategisen johtamisen mallit muuttavat perinteisen toimialan koneenrakennuksen arvon luontia. Eli voidaanko siis sanoa, että tällaiset epäjatkuvuuskohdat, kuten esimerkiksi nyt korona-aika, ovat sinun kiinnostuksen kohteesi? Joo, siis varmaan tämä on aika pitkä kaari sekä aikaisemman työn kautta että myöskin sitten Toisaalta akateemisen innostuksen aihe, tämä, mitä tapahtuu siellä kulman takana ja se on inspiroinut aina ja joskus vähän silleen, että läheiset täytyy vähän repiä tähän nykyhetkeenkin, että joo, ehdottomasti näin. Niin ja tosiaan tämä seuraavat puheenvuorot liittyvät nimenomaan tähän, että mitä, minkälaista elämämme on sitten koronan jälkeen, eli katseet hieman sitten tulevaisuuteen. Pääset tosiaan kohta keskustelemaan näistä tarkemmin, mutta jos mietitään omaa kansainvälistä uraasi, voisitko poimia työpolultasi muutamia oppeja, jotka olisivat kenties vinkkinä uraa aloitteleville. Tiedetään, että täälläkin meillä varmasti yliopiston nyt tätä tilaisuutta seuraa moni opiskelija. Joo, mä, jos mä ehkä aloittaisin siitä, että meillä on hyvin lahjakkaita opiskelijoita ja tavallaan arvosanat on tärkeitä, niin ensimmäinen neuvo olisi tavallaan se ehkä, että ehkä vielä tärkeimpää on se, että opettelee todella hyvin se, missä se oma intohimo on ja, ja samanaikaisesti kuitenkin sitten pitää semmoisen uteliaisuuden myöskin asioihin, jotka eivät ole juuri sitä, koska se on kuitenkin osa tätä omankin osaamisen soveltamista. Ja mun mielestä siihen niin rakentuu sisään myöskin se ajatus, että oikeasti niin kuin, ö, opettelee ymmärtää sellaisia mielipiteitä myöskin, jotka ei vastaa omiaan. Et se olisi ehkä tällainen yksi, joka nyt ensimmäisenä tulee tässä opiskelijaneuvona mieleen. Ja, ja tota, myöskin sen mä näkisin tärkeänä, että oltaisiin mukana opiskelijatoiminnassa ja mietittäisiin myöskin sitä opiskelijaelämää, koska siellä on paljon sellaista oppia, mitä, mitä mikään meidän kurssi ei kykene antamaan. Ja sitten ihan viimeisenä neuvona tämän kansainvälisen seminaarikin aiheen mukaisesti, että menkää ulkomaanvaihtoon. Niin. Ja ehkä kaiken kaikkiaan, jos mitä tästä nyt saa, niin enemmän ymmärrystä kaikesta. Kyllä, varmasti näin. Se, se isoin sana. Kyllä. Kiitoksia. Tästä te saatte jatkaa. Ja nyt liinoilla pitäisi olla myös Julian Birkin show. Olkaa hyvä, stage is yours. Joo, kiitos. It's my um, great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. This session is a little bit different. We came with a, uh, this sustainability 
teams and so on, but this pandemic happened in the middle of the preparation and we were able to have this uh, this perspective as part of our discussion and that's great. Uh, Professor Julian Perkinsor, he's a known scholar uh, and the Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship in London Business School. As a Deputy Dean, he's also in charge of the executive, executive education and learning innovation. He has been in the list of top 50 global management thinkers, and these were just some of the highlights of his merits. But more can be read in, in our web page of the event. So, Julian, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Matty. I hope you can see me and you can see my uh, screen, my, my PowerPoint presentation. So I was going to talk for about 15 minutes uh, to, to you about this very ambitious, uh, bold statement, <laughs> the world after Corona, because obviously we are still very much living in a Corona world. And of course, this has huge implications for all of us at all levels, at a societal level, at a business level, and at an individual level. And so I want to be a little bit provocative, but hopefully also fairly practical in terms of what I see happening, particularly for businesses themselves. I'm not going to talk so much about the societal consequences. We live in this world of radical uncertainty. And indeed, if I had been giving this talk one year ago, I would probably have said something similar as a starting point. But of course, you, you kind of believe me now. And, and it is worth just separating out the different dimensions of uncertainty. And, and, and many of you will be familiar with this, but it's very important uh, starting point. We, we live in a world where bad stuff happens, where you know there's a, a weather event and our house gets destroyed, or whether you know we're, we're we're exporting to a country as a business and and the currency in that country gets devalued or whatever it is, and the sorts of risks on the left hand side of this chart we sometimes call them known unknowns. Uh, these are the risks that we can, to some degree, hedge against. We can literally buy insurance to account for the possibility of these things happening because there is enough data out there that insurance companies are prepared to actually put up decent amounts of, uh, of money to us if we're prepared to invest in insurance against them. So on the left-hand side, we've got all the insurable, somewhat predictable, understood risks. And then, of course, you've got the coronavirus, and you've got, if you go back to 9-11, uh, we could probably put the great financial crisis of 2008 in here as well. These are sometimes called black swan events. You've probably heard that term. And a black swan event is something which takes us all by surprise. It was not foreseen, but, and this is an important point, once it's happened, Everybody says, ah, but we could see that this was going to happen anyway. There were lots of lots of evidence that it might happen, and suddenly it did happen, uh, and it took us by surprise, but perhaps it shouldn't have. Everybody understands today that some sort of global pandemic was likely to happen at some point, uh, and even terrorist attacks are to some degree foreseen. And, and the reason we call them black swans is because they take us by surprise, and obviously, therefore, they are not... Insurable, they are unknown unknowns in the vernacular. And these are the events which, of course, businesses is hopeless at planning for. Most businesses, you know, had in mind the possibility that there might be a pandemic, but they never took it seriously enough, or at least most of them didn't, to actually plan for it. And just to, to, to finish and indeed to, some, to complicate the picture, what do we do about global warming? Global warming is, is not a... A, uh, an insurable event in the way that some of the stuff on the left is. But it's also very, very different from a pandemic and from a terrorist attack because global warming, sometimes we call these gray rhinos as distinct from black swans. Global warming has the characteristic that it is entirely foreseeable. Indeed, it is happening as we speak. But the trouble is it's happening so slowly that there is a risk that we don't act on it because there's never any precipitating event that causes us to really actually change our behavior and our investment. So I don't know quite how 
we resolve the global warming conundrum in terms of how do we mobilize action across countries to address it, what I do know is that it's a fascinatingly different category of risk and threat than something like a pandemic where obviously governments acted swiftly and arguably they overreacted, whereas in the world of climate change, governments are almost certainly underreacting. So those are the sets of risks that we face. As I say, these work at multiple levels in terms of what does this mean for us as individuals, for businesses, and for society. I'm going to focus in my brief remarks about the implications for business, because that's the world I really know best. But I will finish with a couple of, of additional comments. In the world of business, as I say, we are, are accustomed to predicting a, a, a linear extrapolation of the past in our business plans. We'd like to think that everything is going to gradually get better over time. And of course, that was never true. And it certainly isn't true today. What really happens in the world of business is that it is punctuated. You know, the, the, the steadily increasing, improving situation is punctuated by negatives, sudden death threats, death threats to our business, to our livelihood. And obviously the pandemic is an extreme version of that, but there have been many before that. Uh, and as I say, these happen sporadically and almost without warning. But there are also golden opportunities as well. I mean, every business um, likes these things. This is, for example, an opportunity to buy out a competitor because that competitor has got into trouble. It might be an opportunity born of a particular technology which you're good at and that you have an opportunity to, to ride the wave of good fortune that you've had for several years. And so my point is, is very simple, that the business planning process that most organizations have traditionally used uh, doesn't work in a world of punctuated radical uncertainty. We simply need to take seriously the idea that our planning process needs to evolve. And lots of tools exist, scenario planning, real options, I'll get back to some of these, that we haven't taken as seriously as we should have, and we need to start working with more comprehensively. What's the language we should use? If I'd been giving this talk a year ago, I'd probably have talked a lot about strategic agility. Agility is this ability to move quickly and easily. And indeed, agile has now come to take on this very particular meaning around the way that we organize or self-organize work teams, you know, working closely with customers, doing constant iterations, taking charge of their own activities. There's nothing wrong with agility, but I think the important point to bear in mind is that agility is not always what you need when there is a shock. When there is a shock to the system, what we need is resilience. And there's a more than semantic difference. Resilience is the capacity to withstand these negative shocks. And we can learn an awful lot from nature. You see a little image there of a, a tree clinging on, trying to put down roots even when there is no soil. Uh, nature is very resilient, resilient over the long term. Companies, organizations need to become more resilient. And I think my point here is really very simply that agility and resilience are not the same thing. Go back to the global financial crisis, what happened there was that the agile companies, things like companies like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were hugely agile, but they were not resilient. It was the traditional big bank holding companies like Chase Manhattan and Citigroup that were actually resilient to the threats that were going on in that period. Resilience is what allows us to bounce back. We need to figure out better ways of building our resilience. So let me suggest three time horizons in this quest for resilience. Uh, and the first one is, is very, and this is sort of has passed. I mean, this is from the period, I'm gonna say middle of March this year through to about June or July. Every company was simply trying to keep the show on the road, simply trying to maintain their existence. And sometimes that was only possible with government support. And obviously every government did things a bit differently, but most countries in, in Europe were quite good at supporting their businesses 
through the pandemic. And sometimes that was about refinancing and so forth. That's the first horizon in, in any crisis. And as I say, for most companies, that horizon has passed. Most of us are in the second horizon, which is this business of operating under extreme, profound uncertainty. I'll give you an example from where I am, London Business School. You know, at London Business School, we are trying to plan for the future when you cannot plan. In other words, is it possible for people to come to London to take executive programs at the moment? Probably no. I mean, very few countries can just fly into London. People from very few countries can just fly into London, do a one-week course, and then fly home at the moment. And so our planning process has to become just so much more um, open-minded when it comes to making changes. And we are having to rethink our financing. We're having to rethink our manpower planning. All of these things whilst we just don't know how governments and how society is responding. All of those things are really kind of keeping us awake at night. And we have to, that's where we have to use these very, very different techniques. Uh, the notion of, for example, real options thinking. We make an investment in something that gives us the right, but not the obligation, to actually follow through on that investment. It means investing, for example, in our digital capabilities, for obvious reasons, because those are fungible, in other words, they are things which we can use in multiple different ways, regardless of how things work. And we obviously have to scale back certain things accordingly. So that's the, the period, I think, the sort of the, the horizon in which most of us are working. But it would be remiss not to acknowledge the sort of the next wave of planning. And we don't know how long this pandemic is going on. Uh, I put two years there, but you know, I don't know any more about when this is going to finish than you do. But I think we do have to stay, say to ourselves, even once we're through the pandemic as such, businesses will not be the same again because businesses will be much more attuned to the possibility of these sort of things happening again. And longer term resilience means a fundamentally different approach to some very, very basic questions about, for example, which businesses should we be in? I'll give you one very neat, specific example, just to clarify what I'm saying. Um, if you go back to the famous case of Kodak, We are checking the uh, lines. Uh, obviously, you see that uh, Professor Perkinshaw disappeared for a while. We are fixing the problem, but already, as you could see, that we had uh, lots of lots of uh, inputs for an interesting discussion, and, and uh, this is kind of now a good timing for me to uh, urge you to give comments, questions uh, for for Professor Perkinshaw while he back in in the in the in the. Uh, program. Uh, can I see in the other screen also already if there are some of the comments? Is there any comments already? Uh, I cannot see the screen, but anyway, uh, I think that uh, they are too small there. Can you make it, can you make it bigger? We are fixing the problems already. Uh, there are already good uh, comments here. Are they from the? They are from the pre. pre, pre. So, and now we have just hearing that we are back into the connection to London. So, Julian, uh, you can continue. Can, can you? Yes, we can. can. You can yes, we can. Can you? Um, we don't, I don't see the you, slides right now, but okay, you know. not a, not a problem. I can do that in one instant. So, apologies for that. Um, I just disappeared, but it looks like I'm back, so I can. Yes. Is that okay, Matty? Can I just carry on? Yes, you can carry on. We just don't see the slides at the moment, but uh, the, okay, the slides will be with you in a second they because are I am. Yes, we back in line. Good. Okay. Well, look, this is the this is the world of profound uncertainty <laughs> we live in. So. 
we could almost have planned that as a as an example of how we have to be resilient and agile. So I was just making the point that that long term resilience is sometimes about actually um, making investments that might have option value in the future. And I was going to tell you the brief story. Let me just do it in in 20 seconds. Um, Kodak died as a company, but Z uh, Fuji, Fuji Film survived. And one reason that Fuji Film survived is that it maintained its presence as a chemical company and it used its chemical business to create a line of cosmetics and now a line of pharmaceuticals, whereas Kodak had sold its chemical business in the late 90s. And so that that sort of philosophy of deliberately not putting all of your eggs in one basket as a business philosophy is one I think that lots of companies are taking serious in the future. So I'm, I'm almost finished. Let me just take two, two or three more minutes just to, to make a couple of last points and then we'll move to the discussion. I think the implications of the coronavirus pandemic on us operates at multiple levels. Let me take four different levels. We can take the level of, of the globe, of society as a, as a whole, and, and it's very clear that globalization, the interlinkages, interdependencies between, between all of the countries of the world is on the wane. And that was true even before the pandemic. You know, you could argue that the high watermark of global interdependence was probably hit about five years ago. And we started seeing the whole Brexit and Trump effect as countries became a little bit more isolated. And of course, this is going to only get exacerbated with the pandemic. Um, why, why is that? Very obviously, because governments yep. are becoming more interventionist. They are becoming more protective. Their first responsibility is to look after their citizens. Uh, they are intervening in terms of helping to support business. They're intervening in helping to support people with basic minimum incomes. And they are absolutely closing borders, not in a way that I think is entirely productive or helpful, but you can absolutely understand why they are doing that. Uh, on the business side, as I've talked about, we are seeing a period of resilience and, and retrenchment. In other words, trying to sort of scale back, going back to the core business, the core business which is supportable and protectable, and to some degree doing fewer of the exciting new things that they, they used to do. For example, you know, global supply chains, the idea that we would actually work in a seamless way with, with other companies across borders. All of that is being a little bit challenged now because of the, 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 the less ease with which we can travel across borders. And the final few minutes, if, if, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to just share the results of a, a study I did literally last month, which only one audience before you has ever seen, which is the implications on us as individuals, because quite clearly the pandemic has changed the nature of work. And the future of work for the next few work years is going to be a lot of us working virtually from home, uh, much fewer human contacts with those around us. And unfortunately, particularly for graduates, this is a terrible time, there are literally fewer jobs available and fewer opportunities to move into interesting jobs. So I'm just going to share this final slide before we move to the discussion. Um, which is, as I say, some research I did just last month. I've been fascinated by the implications of working from at home, home, virtual working, for managers, for people like ourselves, who are trying to get our employees to work more effectively. And one piece of data I got was that, in fact, it turns out that people often feel a much greater sense, strangely enough, of motivation, intrinsic motivation, to do their work when they're working from home. Because nobody's standing over them, they are actually saying, I am doing this work of my own volition. Therefore, I believe it is more interesting, perhaps more valuable to the company. And the one piece of data which I want to share with you before we finish is looking at the whole list of things that managers do to get the best out of their people. And there's lots on this slide, I appreciate, but what I've done is I've bracketed the activities of managing into how do we manage ourselves? How do we manage specific tasks? How do we manage others? 
And then how do we manage the context, the people around us? And I did some initial data collection on this subject back in 2018, just two years ago. And I got people to say how effective they were at each of these different activities. And then what I did just last month was I said, look back over that period of lockdown and tell us how effective you were in these activities during that lockdown period. And it was a slightly different sample, but it was very similar people. And the data on the red dots there is as followed. Let me just highlight four points that come out of this. Some of this is intuitive. Some of it is a little bit surprising. Now, point one is people on average are saying that they are, because they've got more time to focus and reflect, they're actually more effective at managing themselves at actually kind of figuring out what they're doing, how to manage their time, how to cope with change. Secondly, um, in terms of just getting work done, making decisions, solving problems, people say, yeah, we're pretty good at this. Actually, that hasn't changed much. We can do most of this stuff quite effectively in a lockdown situation, with the one exception that we're not very good at creative and innovative activities, for reasons which I think are fairly obvious. The third category is where it's interesting. We are losing the human touch. We're well, not completely, we aren't, but it is a fact, if you look at the data, that on most of these dimensions, people say, I am less effective at getting the best out of the people around me than I was in a pre-lockdown situation. And there's lots of tricks and tips for us to think about in terms of doing that better. And then finally, in terms of managing our context, most of that is also okay. The one exception being, we are saying that we're not as good at working with our customers as we were before. And again, there are very obvious reasons for that. And that has to become a huge priority for us going forward in terms of finding more effective ways at working, particularly with new customers that we've never had any opportunity to work with before. So I'm going to stop there and we're going to move, I think, to discussion at this point. Hopefully this set of ideas has given you something to think about, both in terms of you as a business person looking to the future, trying to figure out how to manage in this brave new world. But also my final comments about you as an individual, how you enable others, how you get the most out of yourselves and your people. It's a challenging time, but there are, as always, there are opportunities in this time as well as threats. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna suggest that we open up for discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julian. I mean, it was great, uh, both from the micro and macro level. Um, I should directly for a generic question that obviously this uh, pandemic is, is a change. Uh, but then the question is that when we do have the vaccine, what's your opinion that what are kind of things that will return the old same? And what are those kind of things in business that actually will fundamentally change, whether they are strategic, whether they are operational, whether they are behavioral? Any comment on that? No, it, absolutely. So, and, and frankly, when it comes to a vaccine, you know, you know as much about it as I do. What I read tells us, tells me that there will not be a miracle cure vaccine. There will be a series of vaccines which gradually reduce sort of the virulence of this thing. And, and perhaps we have to take you know, a, a vaccine every few months. We will not go 100% back to normal. So the question then becomes, in a world where we're sort of living with this coronavirus as an endemic thing, which is just making our lives a bit more difficult, what would go back to normal? My prediction is that, first of all, um, working from home will become, will stay, will endure as a thing. I expect most companies to say, from now on, we are going to be having, you know, one to two days a week where people come into the office. I mean, sometimes that'll be everybody together. Sometimes it'll be deliberately, you know, one team in, one team at home. And encouraging us to spend, I don't know, three or four days a week working from home. Obviously, I'm talking about, shall we say, professional knowledge workers who can literally work anywhere. And that's going to have huge impact, of course, on real estate, on the, the nature of our cities, because, you know, I take London as an example, but I'm sure Helsinki or Tampere is an equally good example. You know, th the fact is that we just need fewer services in cities when businesses are no longer there in such huge numbers. So that's going to be a huge enduring impact, the nature of what happens in cities. In terms of the longer term impact for businesses, 
you know, I think an awful lot of stuff will gradually return to normal. I, I actually believe that. And, and I do actually believe that within five years, you know, the amount of time we spend traveling around the world will creep back up to somewhere near where it has been in the past. So look, I could go on, but let me, let me okay. pause for breath there because there's lots more we could discuss. Uh, would you refer, I mean, you referred earlier to the 9-11 event and actually uh, business travel did return to the old same, except uh, with higher security. So in that sense, you, you're using the same analogy that it will happen, it, happen again. I think that's right. I mean, it's it's so easy to kind of extrapolate from today and say it'll never come back. But but I actually, I don't believe that. Um, uh, you, your your example is is exactly right. You know, th things will to some degree go back to normal, but with new measures and new. You know, I mean, I can see, for example, that business travel will actually go down for for our lifetimes but economy travel i mean people still want to go on holiday right people still want to to travel around around the world what about the industry i mean uh, the difference between different industries is obvious and uh, we both are in a higher education do you think that this uh, kind of remote work uh, is is kind of a pivotal point for massive online education and, and teaching and learning which yeah. we already have been seeing glimpses but i mean will that be a pivot point yes so and as you say i mean we work in this industry it is clear that online learning was already quite an important thing and now it's a hugely important thing but and so i'm you know i welcome the fact that online learning is growing and is being taken seriously. But I do have a concern, and this is the following. Business education uh, is much more, of course, than the cognitive understanding you get from attending a training course or going to a classroom. Business education has wrapped up in it also a whole lot of stuff around learning by doing. You know, how do I apply the lessons I got in the classroom back to the workplace? How do I learn in, in a work environment through challenging assignments? How do I reflect on my position as a leader by doing some sort of 360 degree feedback analysis with my peers and perhaps talk to my boss about how I can improve my style of working? And so as we rethink business education, clearly putting classes online is the first necessary step. And we've already done that. But we've now got to think through all the other dimensions of what a kind of a comprehensive process of development for individuals as they're entering the workplace and as they're developing through the workplace looks like. And so I'll just give you one very specific example, the notion of, of almost like apprenticeship, uh, being an apprentice, learning by observing a master, some following somebody around, figuring out by watching them how they are working and gradually becoming involved in doing things. You know, that, that's a time, true, tried and tested mechanism for learning in the workplace. And it simply doesn't work very well online. So we cannot lose the face-to-face -face parts of the development process, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think I, I, I share and I will see the same thing. Of course, obviously, we, it's, a, it's a hot topic also in, in our university. Um, something to a totally different topic. Uh, I mean, the heading of our uh, seminarium related to uh, sustainability from deeds to action. Um, you also touched this question of gray rhinos. Uh, What's your view and does this pandemic uh, impact the way sustainability will be in the corporate agenda? Does it have a positive, negative, no no influence? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. So um, I, I do actually believe that, that it is going to help the whole sustainability agenda. Um, so if you think back to, you know, before March, uh, and I went to the Davos World Economic Forum meeting, and it was all about sustainability. I mean, that was the, the big agenda point. So it was already, I think, starting to be taken really seriously by the, you know, the captains of industry. And of course, the pandemic simply encourages us to take even more seriously the possibility that, you know, that we are damaging nature and that nature has a way of kind of uh, affecting what we do, whether we like it or not. So I, I would love to think it, that it helps us to take sustainability seriously. Um, but, 
you know, I think the realistic point that we, we've already touched on is that, you know, assuming we get this pandemic under control um, within a couple of years, it will be, you know, set aside and we will return to whatever the next big issue of the day is. So, so I'm, co I'm optimistic that sustainability is now and will stay on the agenda of, of all the, you know, government and corporate leaders. Um, and I think that we've just got to use this opportunity to continue to kind of push on the, the arguments for acting now. But as I said, you know, the, the nature of the grey rhino is that there is never a certain specific event like there is in a pandemic where you can say, oh my gosh, this is what's happening. And then it becomes, of course, an exercise, a, a behavioural, almost a political exercise in trying to persuade everybody that there is a problem when that problem is not immediate and a kind of a clear and present danger. Uh we will have later today also in our agenda for this session uh, geopolitics. So what's Julian your view on the fact that uh, in this pandemic we have seen lots of moves that uh, you could say that are highly motivated from a national interest. Is that a kind of a threat for businesses, protectionism, kind of more yeah. that type I mean, of yes. issues? I mean, Absolutely, and and you know I, I work in a business school. Uh, my religion, as it were, is is free trade, um, and so I see all of these Brexit uh, type moves towards nationalism and protectionism as unhelpful. And I do absolutely believe that many industries will suffer significantly as a result of it. And you know my 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 genuine hope, of course, is that is that we can start to see fairly quickly that that when countries like the UK decide that they will quit you know, uh, an economic union with their closest neighbours, that, that actually that will damage in those industries in the short term. And that in the medium term, we do actually see a reversion, shall we say, to to what I believe is is the right sort of economic policies, which of course is that um, you know, we don't live in a kind of a zero sum world. You know, we can actually open up our borders to others, and both countries can benefit from it. So, so obviously this is a sector by sector story, yeah. but I but I do think that that the, the, there will eventually within a five year time horizon be a backlash against the you know the Brexit and the Donald Trump protectionist views for the in the shorter term unfortunately it's not good and and we hear donald trump you know shutting the borders on chinese businesses and, and things like that and and i do get extremely worried by that sort of rhetoric a question from audience uh, a kind of do you have a simple advice uh, how to kind of sustain the some of the good practices we have learned during this sort of uncertain period and and keep make them as a kind of a permanent matters rather than yeah, going I mean, backwards. That's right. I mean, look, at a, at a sort of a corporate organizational level, you know, it is absolutely, and I think we're going to do this, actually. I think we're going to see that, and certainly the conversations I have with my colleagues in the leadership team at LBS, this is what we're doing. We're saying, you know, having figured out how to make the technology work, and we figured out that virtual working has all of these advantages, let us now sort of embed those these new ways of working in our day-to-day -day practices going forward. And let's focus, and this is what came out of my final slide with the management activities, let's focus our energies on, you know, the, the three or four places where we are currently struggling, and I've touched on what those are around creativity and innovation and a personal touch working with our employees. And let's try to actually build this hybrid organizational workplace whereby we we have one or two days a week specifically for these sorts of activities i actually don't think it's too hard for us to do that we just simply gotta you know uh, sort of almost like you know quantify the benefits of working from home and then marry them up with the costs and come up with a solution that is somewhere halfway between what we've been doing under duress over the summer versus what we used to do before. Thanks, Julie. I'm just, okay, we, the poll, you can see the poll and uh, it's interesting that we have a exact uh, 
figures now, it means that uh, kind of uh, maturity of the thing that things won't be the same as before. Uh, Good. <laughs> and, and the question is that uh, how would you comment the results? Because of it, s somewhere in the Karnemal Tversky uh, uh, theory is that, you know, as the pandemic is ongoing, we, we, we overestimate kind of the importance, or is this uh, something more? What, well, what's your take? As you say, um, we all suffer from cognitive biases. Uh, we all. Uh, tends to um, put more ever, more sort of weight on on recency. So I I am absolutely not surprised that most people think that that businesses uh, are going to operate differently in the future. In the future. So and, and I think what we have to do is to kind of monitor how this how this tracks over time. Um, it is well known that that um, you know certain habits will endure if we get into the habit of working from home apparently it's about three or four months worth of of such habits those habits at a personal level are likely to stick however it is also true and you touched on it with the the global financial story it is also true that every previous wave of crisis that we've had of different types eventually the world did kind of go back to normal again so so we mustn't fall into the trap of saying this one is different because you know, the global financial crisis and 9-11 were both unique in their own ways, but in fact, the world kind of adapted and, uh, and reverted in many respects to what it was like before. Great, Julian. They were the wise words to end our session and, and uh, we, we kind of uh, take a note of your good advices and uh, I really uh, would like to have my humble thanks for you inspiring us and, and sort of giving us tools and ideas about how to how to look the black swans and, and gray rhinos. Uh, so once once more uh, on behalf of our faculty, on behalf of our university, Julian, warm, warm thanks for contributing for this year's our uh, symposium and with the heading of the world after Corona, which wasn't the easy one, as you said. Thank you. No, my, my great pleasure. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Perhaps <laughs> next time we will meet in the flesh. So thank you, uh, and I hope you have a, a successful rest of, of, this, of, the, of the symposium. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we are moving from um, global business to European Union. We continue with our outstanding speakers. And I'm pleased to introduce Mrs. Sirpa Pietikäinen, who is a, a Finnish member of the European Parliament. She is a former member of the Finnish Parliament, as well as the former Minister of the Environment. Her list of other prominent positions of trust is, is a long one. So please, uh, Sirpa, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and inviting uh, me to this very interesting seminar and of course uh, the most uh, important is to organizing it and i'm very uh, happy and uh, it's easy for me to continue uh, my intervention after uh, the uh, speaker and uh, the discussion what you just had because the political in a way is in in crossroads and it meets a lot of uh, big challenges and new challenges but then again, uh, we lack a bit of the tools for analyzing capacity uh, in general in political scene, uh, what actually is what we should be seeing and thinking uh, momentarily. Okay, and let me try to map a bit of these questions and I'll do it with this uh, one uh, uh, PowerPoint what I have there. So I, I hope you can have a, a quick view on that as well. And uh, politics in crossroads means that we have two sentiments uh, in European level in politics. Uh, the first one is looking back. It's like, you know, trying, uh, driving a car and s uh, half of the uh, people in the car are looking from uh, the uh, rear mirror and telling that picture and telling the advice what to do. And then half of it is looking up front and trying to navigate uh, for the future. So what we talk about. 
we talk about whether we should uh, put our money to Italians or not. By the way, that is not true. Italia has been a net uh, uh, giver to EU budget, not a net receiver. We talk about uh, a Brexit. We talk about uh, short-termism uh, uh, sentiment uh, in silos. I don't want to give the money for the Italians or the Polish or the Romanians, so no, not matter. I want it to myself, be it effective used or not, but not for the others, for myself. So it is race of the nationalism. It is the race of the populism also. You can say whatever and however, like the Italians getting all of our money, uh, even though it's not true, and the sort of a fact-checking uh, in, in uh, media or in politics is not very effective. And we are talking about separately the health issue with the COVID, what about the uh, economic situation, what about the environment, what about the unemployment, what about the political unrest, and, and so on. And then uh, you actually do not get the good and right answer if the question is wrong. And I think that this sort of a backward way of looking politics is the right way. It is the model uh, 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 of yesterday covered with cynicism that the EU Council is filled with. And then, OK, if we look for the forward, what we are talking about, but we should be talking about more. Where do you actually put that 3,000 billion euros? How do you make the economic transformation for the future? And what is the future way it should be going? And my very simple list of questions there is, uh, what changes? And... Uh, what actually does not change, it is as important to see what are the long-term big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, drivers. And I agree that more than a black swan, uh, it is a question of a gray rhinos, what we have there. And what are the drivers? And to see uh, about what changes, uh, I've been studying this summer, uh, a bit, and I know that you probably have extensive studies about what happened after the Black Death and Spanish flu. And what uh, is very significant is that it is it remarks sort of a turning point, uh, not immediate, but within tens and uh, in, in, the, in the case of Spanish flu, tens of years and hundreds, year, hundreds of years in the case of Bla uh, Black uh, Death but it is the social reforms, improving uh, of the workers' position, because it was so much of the workers workers that uh, were deaf uh, because of uh, this. It was the same kind of a, po a political unrest and populism during the uh, actual disease crisis, but in the longer run, it pushed the social reforms further. It pushed also the technological re uh, changes and even more interesting is that it was a turning point for this kind of a division of a powers. <clears throat> it was the race of uh, uh, trade unions and this kind of a third party uh, uh, way of making decisions, especially in the USA, but also in Europe. And after the Black Death, uh, the historians are saying it was the, the end of the <clears throat> Middle Ages and sort of a, <clears throat> a, a slow kick to modernity. So the institutions... Uh, like church uh, were losing their powers, and it was the emergence of a national uh, uh, a nation state. And then again, the good question is, uh, what are those implications? And my belief is it's, it's going to kick up in the longer term. The technological change uh, uh, put a, a second gear on the digitalization, for example, as we've seen. And probably it pushes for more Europe and for more social reforms. And the big question is, is this going to be this kind of a challenge like the Black Death, death was on the church power to traditional uh, uh, nation states and uh, their politicians and their cynicism and short-sightedness. Okay. Then I would like to uh, check um, the point, uh, uh, what are the drivers? And I like very much this uh, way of looking that uh, 
um, if, if we look from different words, what we can say is that this change that is always a, a part of the disruption, even though it wouldn't be a catastrophic, it increases the need for uh, agility in all of the organizations, political systems, political parties, companies. And political systems per se and parties are not very agile. And the big challenge is how do we make them more agile? And then it acts as an accelerator. And this is the uh, working faster than the uh, white waters. You can't just sit and wait, uh, wait it all to pass on. You would need to have the capacity to act on the middle of the storm, and especially on the middle of the storm or middle of the COVID crisis. <clears throat> and you need to uh, fast uh, uh, make the societal changes and the transition changes also in companies fast. And uh, well, that uh, I'm coming back to uh, to that later on. But climate change goes back to two. If you look at the science, it tells you would actually would need to be 2030 uh, uh, climate neutral, not by 2050. So how you create systems that you accelerate the transition and you create the transition plans, and that actually leads, of course, to the uh, third uh, element, and that is the future proof. Because, and this is sort of what we are uh, divided in politics uh, to, to keep the eye on the ball. Because what is not changing is the climate change that is actually speeding up because it is a exponential phenomenon. Be there COVID or what, uh, not, not matter what I or uh, President Trump uh, thinks about the climate change. Fact is a fact. It's all the other environmental issues that I'm not going to lecture now, but remind you only out of the uh, planetary uh, boundaries issues that uh, we are using more than 1.5 planets yearly. And by 2050, we would need almost over three planets, almost four planets, if we don't drastically change our patterns of uh, life. And that is the resource efficiency, circular economy with tenths of the resources, the same outcome. And we are still sort of a, in linear nitty gritty process in these changes, not in this paradigm change and not setting the bar in the right level on, on, on ambition and not understanding that this is uh, going to be uh, a big change and it needs to start between the ears. Then, of course, digitalization. We've seen how it speeded up uh, uh, to. Uh, to, to new frontiers of work and education and, and uh, uh, shops also um, in many countries like in Finland where it has not been so upfront. It's a demographic transformation, uh, people getting older and uh, it is the urbanization, more cities and the city is going to be probably the next sort of a determining factor because already now the vast majority of pe uh, world's people world's wealth and world's uh, uh, capacity to act as well as challenges are in urban areas and cities. So if you could actually sort of amalgize the, the urban areas and cities to be the next key, key players and that uh, to act on the European level and global level, that might uh, be something um, interesting. And then again, of course, the globalization might be a bit hard hit. Uh, momentarily because, uh, because of tr uh, Trumps and everything, populism and everything that. But it's going to go on its way. Uh, this is my, my understanding. And that means that we need uh, bigger and more effective ways to work together, like the European Union. We are only uh, uh, half a, a billion people in European Union altogether. And in Asia, there's uh, uh, in smaller area, more people, more than half of the world's population, 3.5 billion, more than half, about uh, 50, uh, 53rd percent uh, of the uh, 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 GDP and the fastest growing rate. If we can't act together in Europe in health issues, like we see how ineffective the COVID-19 uh, prevention statistics uh, public procurement, uh, or joint procurement of medicines or ventilators or whatever has been about how you uh, actually 
uh, uh, decide when you and how you put the quarantine so open or close the borders. We can see it in, uh, of course, in refugee crisis. We can see it in issues of taxation. So the, the more we do in the European level, it's not out of the member states' capacities because they are things that member states by themselves can not solve. So either they are undone or then we get our grip and act together and we do it on, on European level. So all our actions in politics and that matter in business should be food should proof. It should be climate neutral by 2030. It should be uh, within by 2050, uh, resource efficient by factor 10 and not harming biodiversity. It should really uh, grasp the digitalization and uh, uh, AI, not uh, like putting the uh, wheels on a horse, uh, sort of uh, overlapping uh, on existing structures, but sort of uh, taking this platform e economy structures. It would need to understand what the urbanization and demographic transformation means both in uh, societal and care uh, cultures, economy, and uh, as, as uh, motors of power and figure out how you act together globally to solve the issues. And uh, well, there are millions of other issues I would like to raise, but uh, I guess I've used more than my time and uh, now it would be my turn to, to, to go back to you and uh, give the floor for discussion. Thank, thanks, Sirpa. I think you offered a lot of uh, leads for discussion and, and uh, thank you also for a sort of optimistic view of, of the future. Um, and I think that using your own example that this kind of EU reaction in the in the acquiring vaccine together and those, if you will, uh, the Black Swan actions were pretty united. But then uh, the, the kind of the long term uh, uni unification gets harder, this grey rhino, rhino tile, because then you can have to balance it with something else. And my question is first that, do you think that once we have settled the pandemic, whether it takes a year or two, will uh, EU be more united or less united than before we enter to this era? I really would love to say it is more united, but I'm afraid it, uh, it will be less united because uh, there has been uh, the spread of so much populism in member state level about, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the southern part, it is about the Nordics being uh, mean and nasty and not uh, uh, giving a second thought about uh, anyone else and their problems. So the, the uh, huge misunderstanding and the lack of solidarity. And in our part, it is well, it is the lazy Italians, it is those ones there that uh, uh, that are using our money and uh, we had to pay for them and we would have survived without uh, without the European economy. This is a huge uh, misunderstanding. So that is the hatred. Plus then if you look what, the, what are the newest information from uh, 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 Great Britain's side and Brexit, they totally sign off from the uh, Good Friday Agreement uh, uh, that guarantees ensures the uh, uh, the peace uh, situ uh, peace uh, and, and prosperity in Ireland. If these kind of things can happen, if this kind of a Trumpism, I don't care what happens. I don't care uh, whether this uh, is going to explode. I don't care whether it is truth or not. Uh, uh, it's going to spread, as I'm afraid. We see the, the happenings in Bulgaria, in Hungary, in Poland. It makes it even harder to work together. But the good part in this answer, the optimism is the citizens. You know, in Finland, for example, we debated about uh, uh, a lot, uh, and still debating in, in politics about uh, the rescue package and whether we should enter there or not, and whether we should, should shoulder the, uh, the debt of the others. Then when you ask the people, actually 70%, more than 70% of the Finns were ready to accept the rescue plan. So it's not a big thing. It is the 30% 30 30 that are very noisy that the politics is circulating around. 
And even it was over the 50 person who wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't care and wouldn't have any problems with shared responsibility and paying someone else's debts. That was way, way before what uh, I could even imagine what would be the people's reactions. And if people can grasp that now member states are not uh, their best defenders, and this kind of a sort of uh, 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 cynical, uh, opportunistic, uh, short shirt, short termerism. I just want to maximize my money. It's not going to serve for us. Then people can join and support the positive change in Europe and say, look, let's make a Europe that is every girl's and boy's best friend. And this indeed we need to happen, uh, we need to do if we want to combat climate change and uh, make uh, uh, digitalization to happen and make us competitive and uh, uh, socially secure. Good point there. If you think this discussion about how to divide the money, I mean, let's assume that there is a, some sort of understanding that uh, there is an investment needed to keep the economies, then we have the debate of who is getting how much. But then if you divide the cake differently, how do you see that? Um, uh, what would be the kind of discussion that should we put more of the money to Green Deal type of initiatives rather than a kind of sustaining uh, of, of, let's say, uh, the old way of doing or all things which are not uh, sort of supporting the, for example, the uh, environmental issues. Is that kind of a different debate or can it be a debate which will be becoming, instead of countries, will be between generations? I can see it uh, that it is between the generations. And this is the debate what we are having in European Parliament where you put the money. And actually in the council, very cynical uh, division, we were, uh, the member states were very uh, sort of interested who pays and what, is, is it lending or uh, is it uh, uh, directive, uh, direct uh, investments. And there were not so much discussion about where you put the money. And that actually is important. And it is better to use the money to transform the uh, Visegrad countries and Poland to be environmentally sustainable than uh, try to support, for example, our beet industries. And uh, what is very regrettable and what the parliament is trying to do there is that you do not have these very stringent limits, zero euro for fossils very stringent, do no significant harm principle. Use the common taxonomy to classify how the public funds and the rescue funds are done. And uh, the clawback uh, clause, uh, clause, so that if the mon money would be used in uh, wrong purposes, sort of uh, supporting the existing uh, uh, negative industries, uh, I call it usually walking dead policy, this money could be drawn back uh, to European budgets, like as well uh, the rule of law should be that kind of a critical limit that if you break it, then you don't get the money or it is uh, uh, it is drawn back uh, to back to EU budget. And it needs to be EU wide. It doesn't help only if we do some environmental uh, good uh, uh, support structures. This is good, but it doesn't change the world if the Poland is supporting uh, the uh, uh, fossil fuel, uh, the, the coal mines, for example. And you, uh, we could uh, name millions of examples. So the point is that we should act together and we should have that kind of a synergy of the actions that when the Polish, when the Netherlands and the Fra in, in France and in Finland, we direct in the same uh, direction. For example, uh, investing massively on railroads and uh, uh, future upcoming uh, very fast trains so that we can cut down the European uh, flight uh, that we can see 20, more than 20% 20 uh, uh, increase within 10 years that is totally unsustainable even technically, not to talk, uh, talk about how convenient it is for travelers or, or what it what is the climate impact. Then the question is that uh, Either you do it effectively together, or then you just try to maximize the money for yourself and put it somewhere uh, better for us than for someone else, and uh, no matter how effective, uh, effectively it is used. 
thanks. Uh, moving to a totally different direction, uh, in your slide, uh, you propose that using digital technologies is, is kind of one important enabler for, for kind of better Europe, better environment. Um, the kind of the nature of the digital technologies quite often assume that uh, you have a high number of connections in order to do things. And you can see currently that, and they are based on platforms, many of the platforms are non-European, so really digital Europe has not really succeeded yet. At the same time, I think we are going to a little bit seeing a new cold war in IT. Take a, a TikTok as an example. And third, uh, we have this kind of development where some of the states are using the technology for kind of controlling the citizens, almost like Orwellian type. What's your view kind of on this, that uh, this kind of the uh, sort of uh, dark side of the IT at the moment as an enabler? Well, to me, uh, digitalization and artificial intelligence are like knife. Per se, it's not good or bad, it's just this. Uh, and with the knife, you can kill and uh, be a mass murderer, or you can uh, cut the bread uh, and vegetables for food uh, for people, so it, it's a good thing. And the last commission actually, actually declared, and I liked it very much, that the EU should be in the forefront. It should be the lead of ethical digitalization and AI in the world. That means uh, many things, but one is that uh, uh, we take a note uh, that uh, the privacy and uh, that kind of actions that uh, the uh, uh, technology is not used for controls and surveillance, uh, and that is very big matter. And we should have a, <clears throat> and Europe should uh, uh, initiate it, uh, or should have a actually international convention about it. Uh, about it. Then it is, of course, the cybersecurity, the future proof in that sense, that it can be hackered. Think of the medical devices, if it uh, could, uh, uh, would be hacked by hostile forces and people would be getting uh, wrong doses in cytostasis treatment in cancers or uh, dialysis, uh, some other uh, medications or wrong uh, recipe prescriptions on uh, on diabetes or whatever, what would be the implications of it. Of it. So that is part of the security. And uh, the security is also technical flaws. And what I mean by this is that there are unintentional uh, technical flaws in uh, uh, digital, uh, digital systems and autonomous systems like driving, self-driving cars, and you need to have this kind of a double system, how to back up if something happens. And then the third, and this is the most hardest, what we would need to work a lot, is to dictate what kind of algorithms. That means what kind of an ethics uh, the new uh, digital systems uh, 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 should have. Certainly my uh, toothbrush wouldn't need to have that much of an ethics, but if you think self-driving car, is that going to be very selfish and save always the driver, even though uh, there would be 50 children in the road? Or should it be uh, very unselfish uh, and uh, uh, so save always the mother in the uh, uh, road and kill uh, three old people in the car? Or do we have selfish and unselfish and no matter what cars in the, uh, in the roads? So we would need to take that kind of a responsibilities. What is the ethical code where and how the artificial intelligence works? And of course, there's a lot of threat scenes in the learning capacity and uh, deductive and inductive capacities of the artificial intelligence in the future. But the point is that uh, if you just don't uh, leave the spirit out of the box and leave, leave anyone to develop whatever, you can, with this kind of a guidance, with the algorithms and ethical codes, uh, uh, use it for the, uh, for the good. And yes, there are always people who can uh, use it for the bad, uh, but then again, you can drive a car that indeed has happened uh, uh, as a terroristic weapon 
to to mass crowds of the public but this is not the reason to to sort of uh, be in general uh, scared about the cars and try to uh, ban them thanks that was actually a very good ending that you know we should take the best tools for good better europe better environment better sustainability and then we would have to work against those features of any of the tools that might be harmless like like we have done ever since any technology was invented uh, do we have now the answers of the audience for the poll are they do we have an optimistic audience or less optimistic for one second and it appears that uh, there is a kind of a clear concern of the audience that hold a second that concern of the audience that actually the pandemic will decrease the measures that we have available for for the fight against the global warming i think this is an result that and concern we have to fight against uh, as individual but also as a eu is that kind of a concluding remark sirpa yes indeed i can understand and relate very much to this answer because this is how i'm feeling too very clearly <clears throat> that okay now the wind is turning to to egoistic selfish short-termerism populism but exactly because of that and because uh, of the fact that we do have the resources and possibilities. I think that uh, it is uh, everyone's responsibility to act towards state governments and uh, decision makers and parliaments to change the game and say, look, this is what needs to happen. This is what we deserve. This is what I want you to do. And look, we do have the money. Don't put it on the wrong place or then you have a double problem. Use it. So, if uh, so that you can save both the economy, make the paradigm change in digitalization and uh, platform economies, and that you can solve the environmental problems and make a better life for everybody, because that is possible. It right. is a <laughs> political decision. That what we fight uh, as us as a university, and I, I'm sure that uh, you there fight it as a European Union. Hey, Sirpa. Great, great, great humble thanks for, for this uh, insightful contribution for our seminar and uh, for the topics. And I'm sure that we could have continued the rest of the day. But this, with the short period, I mean, we, we got a lot of insight and a lot of new thoughts and ideas. Thanks once again. Thank you and happy to continue discussions and have a very successful, interesting day uh, uh, further on. Thank you. And now, one step the wider context from European to global organization and geopolitics. And again, we, have, we are very fortunate to have a speaker who has many levels of perspectives for today's discussion. And the title of his uh, introduction, New World Disorder, raises already interest with us. Mr. Kai Sauer is the Under Secretary, Secretary of the State Foreign and Security Policy at the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has a long international career in Europe, United States and Asia. And he has insight, great insight, for example, the United Nations. In 95, Mr. Sauer graduated from our university with a master's degree in social sciences, majoring in international relations. In 2014, Ambassador Sauer was selected of the alumni of the year. So please, Kai, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me and uh, see me? Loud and clear. Uh, the line wasn't too, too good uh, at my end, but uh, just uh, in interrupt me if uh, you are losing me or the connection is, is uh, breaking up. But um, thank you for the, the introduction, uh, very, very generous, and it's uh, great to join you uh, from Helsinki um, as an alumni of uh, the Tampere University. And um, I just uh, spoke uh, to the new recruits of the MFA this, this morning. And uh, when I went through the list of uh, 
those uh, 15 uh, newcomers, uh, young young diplomats, uh, I think about uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, of them were graduates of, of Tampere. So, so uh, uh, Unit Tampere is uh, kind of a bre breeding um, ground for, for Finnish diplomats as, as well. Um, my uh, the title of my talk, uh, uh, "New World Disorder," can actually be uh, understood in in two ways, uh, depending a little bit uh, how you uh, pronounce it. Um, it can be a new world disorder or a new world uh, disorder, and uh, by this uh, taking a more a uh, global uh, uh, approach. Both uh, interpretations are, are interconnected and uh, equally right. So in my remarks, I will uh, draw uh, on my experience as, uh, as a UN uh, ambassador from uh, 2014 to uh, 2019. Um, and during that uh, period, uh, several profound uh, changes uh, uh, took place. Um, the keys of the White House uh, went uh, from uh, President Obama to uh, President Trump. Uh, the UN Secretary General uh, changed. Uh, Brexit uh, happened. There was a surge of, of uh, populism, and uh, a number of, uh, or well, a few uh, EU countries turned from to. Well, two definition which uh, uh, some people like to to use. Uh, so all all these were reasons which finally led uh, the well appreciated uh, think tank uh, Freedom House um, to declare, and uh, I quote: "The share of free countries has declined by three percentage points over the last decade." while the percentage of partly free and not free countries rose by two and one points respectively. So um, over the past years, we have experienced so much change that our political digestive system hardly could cope. And uh, you all are consuming the news. But uh, just to recap, I would like to list in the very uh, telegraphic uh, uh, headlines, six drivers. Um, Sirpa was also talking about drivers, so I'm, I'm continue on, on that track. So I would like to refer to six drivers of global change and one accelerator. So uh, in my view, the drivers are one, uh, globalization, uh, which has caused the uh, relocation of manufacturing and hereby challenged the Western economies and changed the political map in, in many countries. Uh, secondly, the populist movements, which have disrupted traditional political constellations domestically and uh, internationally. Number three uh, is China. Uh, who has challenged the U.S. in economic and political uh, terms, while at the same time the U.S. has abdicated from taking global responsibility. Number four, terrorism, refugee flows, pandemics, and uh, food, food uh, security. They have become existential security uh, threats. Number five, international rules-based order, which was largely built in the wake of the Second World War, has been weakened. And six, new technologies and global tech behemoths have become political factors. And the one accelerator, which we are simply not allowed to forget, is uh, the pandemic, which is one way or the other playing into all the previously mentioned uh, drivers. Now, uh, let's have a look at the drivers a little uh, closer and uh, start with globalization. In the populist slogans, we hear about reversing globalization and repatriating basic production from cheap uh, labor destinations. No doubt, localization and decoupling will happen, as this will be a key component of the US-China rivalry. 
It is part of President uh, Trump. attempt to fulfill his election and deep frictions with not only China, but also traditional uh, U.S. allies. Isolating Huawei and, and banning Chinese tech products, services and investment is a manifestation of this trend. And actually, the current process of isolating Chinese technology from Western economies is the clearest sign of uh, decoupling. Lately, the pandemic has alerted us about the importance of maintaining some key production capacity in locations we can actually control. This meaning in our home country or within our uh, alliances. And I can safely predict that uh, the theme security of uh, supply um, of critical products like uh, face mag masks, uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, vaccines, will become one of the most important topics of the uh, coming political uh, season. Overall, in the current if the current trend continues, globalization is likely to slow down. But as long as uh, we live in the market economy, uh, it will not stop. Now, uh, on populism, obviously there are several factors which have contributed to populism. Economic hardship, uh, such as the financial crisis in 2008 and relocation of production combined with the refugee crisis in 2015, resulted in the raise of populism and the political success of populist movements uh, in most European circumstances, as in Eastern Europe. Uh, in their great book, The Light That Failed, Ivan Krastev and uh, Stephen Holmes refer to a phenomenon called uh, imitation fatigueness. And uh, imitation fatigueness means a certain disappointment and frustration with the deliverables, or rather the lack of the deliverables, um, a, resulting uh, from the liberation uh, of the Soviet dominance. Putting it in the nutshell, for 20 odd years, the expectations of the population related to the Western standards of living were not met, which then translated in support for illiberal uh, rulers. Similarly, discussions in the course of the Brexit campaign or the U.S. elections have bolstered populism. And intolerance, Fair, which also seems to have become one of the key accelerators of change. Outside influence in U.S. elections campaign in 2016 and the British referendum on Brexit seems undisputed. The spread of nationalism and populism has also led to the weakening of the treaty-bound international system, which has been the safeguard, especially for sm smaller countries like uh, Finland. Personally, <clears throat> the fearing of populism has been uh, difficult to, to absorb. My political con consciousness has been shaped by an admiration for the moral courage of the Central European democracy movements now active uh, in the different form and different generation uh, in, in Belarus. Regionally, <clears throat> like in Europe, populism has led to disintegration, as in the form of Brexit and the possible second referendum against integration. Also, the common values on which the European Union was founded, values that also Finland subscribed to when we uh, joined the Union in 1995, have been questioned by countries led by populist figures. And the same countries, by the way, undermine the ability for the EU to be a strong and cohesive global actor. Now on China. China has challenged the US as the sole global economic and political power. China's global influence is increasing because of actions of, on several fronts, political, economic, and military. The much-discussed Belt and Road Initiative is a tool of Chinese soft power, but it serves also um, creating dependencies. 
China's investments and loans generously distributed through the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and um, they don't have disturbing human rights or democracy strings attached. There's no conditionality, as with the EU or other Western funding. The pattern is creating dependencies which then can be used as leverage for achieving political goals, such as shaping the international and normative environment or electing candidates to lead international organizations. Just a, as an example and a question, how do you think an indebted country votes in the UN General Assembly when the issue is about human rights? In my experience, the vote goes along, along the lines of the creditor. China's influence is no stronger, uh, stranger uh, at uh, European shores either. How to react to Chinese outreach is one question challenging EU's cohesion and defining EU's global role. On global challenges uh, like climate change and migration, they require global responses, meaning collective agreements and institutions. Over the past years, the number of challenges has increased while the commitment to collective global response has diminished. It is sad to see that uh, at the 75th anniversary of the United Nations Charter, which was celebrated uh, last June, the organization enjoys insufficient support to resolve the growing list of conflicts. The deadlock of the Security Council and gaps of funding of the UN agency epitomizes the negative state. Agenda 2030 on sustainable development and the Paris Agreement both go back to 2015, five years. And they are the last remarkable achievements of reinforcing the rules-based international order. Instead of creating new binding international law, we have agreed on compacts, which are voluntary, not mandatory uh, in nature. Where the International Declaration of Human Rights to be negotiated today, I doubt there would be an agreement like in 1948. Now, on the international uh, rules-based order, the framework uh, was essentially created in the aftermath of the Second World War. The aim was to create mechanisms for collective security and economic reconstruction. Uh, to create an order which would prevent disruptive powers like fascism to re-emerge. These institutions, the UN, the EU, NATO, World Trade Organization and others, even with their imperfections, have serve, served us relatively well. What we have seen recently, however, is that the rules are increasingly disregarded. They are selectively applied or they are being revised in order to better fit the political orientation of those who are regarding the current interpretation of the rules as too in intrusive. According to John Eikenberry, who is a, a scholar uh, and a diplomat, the liberal order is collapsing because its leading patrons, starting with the US, have given up on it. On the other hand, um, and uh, to be fair, we need to remember that committing to multilateralism was a deviation of traditional U.S. foreign policy until the Second uh, World War. Since the time of George Washington, the U.S. has opted rather on distance than proximity with the rest of the world. It has been extremely reluctant when it comes to giving up uh, sovereignty in exchange of international cooperation and international law. Be it as it may, we have perhaps naively taken for granted the United States' uh, potential to remain an internal uh, like-minded force, a country that rules the waves but doesn't wave the rules. This has proven to be a miscalculation. <clears throat> On the new technologies, uh, they constitute a threat but at the same time offer several opportunities. On the negative side, international norms with regard, uh, for instance, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems are largely pending. Also, some governments use artificial intelligence in ways that severely 
uh, breaches privacy and breaks with human rights. On the positive side, new technologies offer opportunities to accelerate development and well-being. Healthcare and education, especially girls' education, are sectors where great leaps of progress have been made over the past years by using technology. Uh, giants like Apple, uh, whose current value is uh, $2 trillion, uh, I had to check how many zeros there are in the uh, trillion. There are 12 uh, zeros. Amazon uh, value $1.14 uh, trillion, Facebook $600 billion, and Google $1 trillion have become more powerful than many states. Their power is financial, as was underlined by the fact that they were recently invited to a congressional uh, hearing in the US. And their power is political, as we have seen in the cases where they have been used as platforms to advocate uh, political agendas or incite hate against certain ethnic groups. So these were the drivers contributing to the glo global change. And uh, the pandemic uh, was not mentioned. Uh, why not? In my view, the pandemic is not a driver per se. Rather, it's an accelerator. It has contributed to division of societies, countries, and even intergovernmental organizations. It has contributed to the erosion of the rules-based international system and curtailed individual freedoms. It has intensified the rivalry between the US and China, and it has triggered uh, technological uh, change. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, um, this conference is about uh, leadership, addressing the vacuum of global leadership which would help us to solve the critical questions uh, mentioned in the course of uh, this uh, conference and uh, also my presentation is key. We need domestic leadership, we need uh, regional uh, leadership, and here the onus is on the European Union, and we need global leadership, which means that the November elections are critically important. We also need the functioning rules-based international system to channel this leadership uh, into action. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. And thank you. Thank you, Kai. I think it was a extremely comprehensive view on the on the today's topic, and I think we could have the discussion of all your six drivers alone for the rest of the day. But I mean, try, I'm trying to pick up some some perspectives. And I think that the first one was that you, I think you spelled out quite clearly this, because the general heading is world after Corona, that this pandemic is pretty much an uh, accelerator or a kind of a sp speeding up some of all these geopolitical trends you mentioned without really uh, being a driver itself. It's just sort of making this uh, others more stronger and and we can see with your examples but what do you think that uh, uh, when you ended up the kind of that uh, the leadership issue uh, i could could you argue that and kind of this china u.s discussions uh, europe has been a little bit left aside and my question for you is that is there any chance that uh, Europe can take a role in this discussion to finding more like a unilateral solution than, than just sort of following the fight like in a tennis match? Yeah. Uh, thank you. And I, I hope uh, Sirpa is uh, still listening because I would like to have this conversation with her, her as well. I mean, th this has been an, an issue which has given me a lot of uh, concern and um, and headache. In my view, uh, the EU didn't deliver in the beginning uh, when the pandemic uh, broke out. Um, I like to compare the reaction uh, to, to a safety briefing on the airplane. Uh, the crew gives you instructions uh, that you should first uh, uh, in the situation of an emergency, you should put the the oxygen mask on your uh, face and then help your 
your fellow passenger to uh, get the mask. Okay, so what did the EU do? The individual countries, they took the mask, put it on their face, um, and then there was a very, very uh, long gap uh, before they remembered that there's a neighbor uh, as, as well. So this uh, kind of expression of uh, solidarity came with the long uh, delay by the outside uh, actors, uh, by countries like China and, and Russia, uh, who tried to fill this uh, uh, vacuum. There were deliveries from, from Russia with the sign uh, from Russia with love. There were um, masks uh, sent uh, from, from China. There were political uh, messages. But um, to be frank, um, I don't think these countries, Ru Russia and China and, and others, they, they don't have the, the same skills for soft power, not, at least not, not yet. And this um, attempt to fill the political vacuum uh, did not, uh, it wasn't uh, very, very credible, especially since the EU uh, got its act together later on. And also individual uh, countries, they started to show um, expressions of, of solidarity. Uh, take Germany, for, for, for example, this uh, air uh, lift uh, bridge uh, from France, from Alsace uh, uh, to, to Germany, and also vis-a-vis -vis Italy. So the situation improved uh, 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 a lot. The EU is terrible at uh, com communicating. They, it's, it's surprising how amateurish uh, the EU strategic uh, communication uh, capacity is. The EU is very good at uh, communicating in, in, in uh, declarations, which means that they put uh, a two-page uh, declaration or statement on the web page. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, exaggerating here, but uh, this is um, broadly the approach. So uh, I think the communication effort uh, in the in the course of the pandemic uh, failed failed as well. That needs to be needs to be better. But okay, um, we were all facing a new situation. So you you learn from these experiences, and hopefully um, we will improve. Our performance in, in the future. Thanks. Uh, jumping from uh, EU to international organizations, your view on UN or international organization for that matter was a little bit gloomy. Do you think that there's a way of, of them also finding the role? Or uh, like you said, that you know, if you handcuff the creditors, you have a bit of a problem. But uh, what would be the way of them kind of regaining their credibility as a mediator? Yeah, I mean, th this is a, a question which is posed quite frequently. Why is the UN uh, not delivering in the more effective way? And now it's legitimate to ask it um, in the pandemic uh, context. And the answer is still the same. The UN is the sum of... its member states uh, will. And uh, their reaction to the pandemic with 27 member states is imperfect or leaves room for Im Im uh, Im improvement. So how do you expect an organization with 193 uh, board members to react? It is, um, I mean, you, you can extrapolate uh, the the reaction uh, uh, to, to the number of, of member states. So it is bound to be uh, weak because there are so many interests uh, in, involved. And uh, of course, with the current level of uh, commitment of the uh, main uh, financier of, of the United uh, Nations, uh, it's, it's even, even weaker. Um, 
the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, he has uh, acted uh, bravely. He is a great uh, orator, and um, he has rolled out uh, several uh, initiatives on behalf of the UN uh, to uh, react to, to the, the pandemic. So I think there's a will, but uh, it cannot be uh, you know, be better without the stronger commitment uh, from the side of the member states. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, sort of st shortly leading to our results of our vote, but before that, I, I, I just grasped one thought you had, and I think it was the same thought that Sirpa had, that uh, kind of in the black clouds, it seems that one of the silver linings might be actually the citizen movement, and you both mentioned that, but uh, that's just a picking kind of from your board presentations, but let's see how our audience, uh, how, how optimistic or uh, pessimistic they are about the international organizations. A um, little bit on the pessimistic side that the national agendas will increase. Uh, and again, we have the same question that it seems to be currently ongoing whether we overestimate what is currently ongoing or is, is this kind of a uh, picture itself uh, any 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 was it a surprise if you read the results that two thirds think that the national agendas will kind of be the one dominant for for at least for a time period Uh, uh, participation <laughs> at the at the polling. Uh, I would agree with that assessment. Yeah, but did did, did you? Act, I mean, I think you mentioned also the silver lining is that the citizens might actually disagree in many of the countries. Um, it 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 could it could be. Um, I think. Uh, Citizens in, in uh, the situation of crisis like this, they are also uh, quite self, uh, I mean, tur turning inward, inwards. So as you have seen in, in Finland, um, the support to the government uh, coalition has basically increased uh, during the crisis, uh, which means that uh, the actions uh, which we have taken have been approved by by the by the population um, and this might be the case in in some other um, at least uh, those countries who have uh, successfully fought out of the the pandemic might be the case as well but uh, ge generally uh, I think the citizens participation is a, is a great uh, influencer um, in international uh, politics and uh, there, the trend has been uh, on on the increase, uh, uh, citizens' participation, and if you break it down, you can also, um, you know, go to to NGOs, uh, think tanks, and the business community and the academia. Not to forget the academia as well. Thank you for this good words, and uh, this last table is is kind of a good sign that. Uh, there is a lot to be work with all those stakeholders you mentioned for, for making sure that we can back to this kind of international treaty-based stability. But yes, uh, we are finishing now with our last session uh, of the Corona, our world after Corona, and I really, really would like to warmly thank you, Kai, for this excellent presentation and good discussion. And also I would like to thank you as an excellent alumni i think you will be and you are a role model of many of our students over there in the in the other side of the screen saying that what kind of careers you can build on by studying and like you said you have 20 20 30 percent of those already nearby you so once more really really warm thanks for this participation thank you for for having me and uh, congratulations for having appointed the new alumni of the year, uh, our <laughs> prime minister, I think she, she was a good, uh, good pick. And have a good conference. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And now back to Milla then, and you will yes, take thank lead you. again. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Todella kiinnostava ajatuksia, tätä olisi voinut jatkaa ehkä Aivan tuota, iltaan asti ja huomisen asti. Ja kuten tiedämme, niin tässä on paljon ilmassa olevia asioita. Mietitään Yhdysvaltain rooli, Kiinan rooli, EU-rooli. Kaikki nämä asiat, mitä tapahtuu sitten koronan jälkeen, niin oikeastaan vasta sitten aikahan sen näyttää. Kyllä, kyllä. Ja tämä, tämä keskustelu juuri oli tiedekunnamme ytimessä, että monimutkaiset ongelmat vaatii lähestymistä aika monesta näkökulmasta. Pitää katsoa pistosta, pitää katsoa geopolitiikkaa, pitää katsoa kansainvälisiä organisaatioita ja niin poispäin. Että tämä, oli, tämä oli kuin pieni kattaus tiedekunnamme sielusta. Niin, no se, on kyllä, se on kyllä aivan totta. Kiitos sinulle keskustelun kiitos. johtamista ja kiitos teille siellä etäyhteyksien päässä. Julian Birkinshaw, Kai Sauer ja Sirpa Pietikäinen. Erinomainen keskustelu takana. Kiitoksia vielä tästä. Ohjelma täällä ykköskanavalla jatkuu siis kello 14. Aiheenamme on Itämeri. Ja seuraavaksi pureudutaan vähän tähän itse tapahtumaan johtajuus symposiumin historiaan, miten tähän on tultu ja, ja miltä tämä nyt tänä päivänä näyttää. Siitä aivan hetken kuluttua.